Hey there, Arthur Hill here with On Trend, the show designed to keep you on the right side of the trend. And the first trend we're going to focus on is the S&P 500 and the key levels to watch. QQQ led an oversold bounce yesterday. We'll look at that in detail. We're going to break down XLK and XLC, as well as home builders and look at some banking stocks. So we're going to start off with a chart of the S&P 500. These are weekly bars going back five years for a longer term perspective. We also have 14 week RSI and I added a four week moving average just to smooth out some of the squiggles in that RSI line. And we'll get to that in detail. But when we look at the chart for the S&P 500, you can see it moved above 2800 there in January 2018, moved above 2900 in September 2018 and October there. And then here in March, February, March, we moved just above 2,800. So if you look at the period since January 2018, the index has gone nowhere. And we can click the inspect button at the top of the chart, and then you can drag a slider there. So I'll click and I'll drag to the right and if you look over to the left hand side of the chart, you can see 59 periods. So it's one more week because I did this chart on Friday and now we've got Monday's trading here. Now it isn't unusual for the index to go nowhere for extended periods. You know, keep in mind we had an amazing advance from early 2016 until early 2018. And prior to that, we had a 90 week consolidation, you know, depending on where you start it. But, you know, this is well over a year of going sideways. And the range, you know, was roughly 1800 to 2100. So it's like a 15% range, roughly. Now we're in a big range now. And you can see these three highs here. That's what the bears will be pointing to. And what we've been given here with Monday's bounce is a first support level to watch there. And if we break below last week's low, then that is going to be a negative on a weekly closing basis below last week's low. That's going to be a negative. Now for RSI, all I've got here is 14 week RSI. And you can see a lower high there in September, October and below 70. So that's a bearish failure swing. You move down, then you have a bounce, and the bounce does not get back above 70. The prior move was above 70. This move is below 70, and then you break below that prior low. So that completes the bearish failure swing. Now, since then, we've moved back above 50 in the early part of this year, and we're holding above 50. But that's the next level to watch as far as weekly RSI is concerned and the four week moving average. So if RSI closes, the end of the week is on Friday. We're just on Monday. We got a little uptick yesterday because we started the week, but this is an unfinished RSI value. It won't be finished until Friday. But if we close below 50 in RSI and if uh, that four week moving average goes below 50, that's going to be a negative for the market. So that's two things to watch here. We have this support level from this low, 200 day just happens, or the 40 week just happens to be there, and 14 week RSI. So I'll remain on the side of the bulls as long as these two things hold. Here's the daily chart for the S&P 500. And I've gone over the importance of the 200 day and the importance of smoothing out your signals by using another moving average instead of just the close. Because as you can see here, we had a number of closes above and below that 200 day in October, November. And here we've already done it. We've closed above, we've closed below, and now we've closed back above. So that's why I think you need to smooth it out. What you smooth it out with is your choice. You can use a five day, you can use a 20 day, you can use a 50 day. My choice is a 20 day. That's kind of like in between the close and the 50 day. 25 would be exactly in between. That'll work too. Uh, but you can see here that there is the 20 day moving below the 200 day. 
and it stayed below, and then it just crossed above. So, you know, it's a moving average crossover. It's going to have lag. All moving average signals have lag. But as long as it remains above, the bulls get the benefit of the doubt. And with this bounce here that we had on Monday, we now have a reaction low there to watch. And I would say if the 20-day moves below the 200-day and we close below 27.25, then we have to watch out. All right. At best, we have a correction of the prior advance, maybe a 50% retracement, 38% retracement. At worst, you know, we move into, we stay in that trading range or we move down to these lows. I don't know. Uh, but as long as we hold those levels, I'll stay with the bulls. So QQQ led the way higher yesterday with a 2% surge and had a lot of help from Google and Microsoft and Visa the three top holdings in the technology SPDR, which we'll get to in a little bit. Now, if we look at SPY here, last week I showed some potential correction targets. And sure enough, as soon as you show, show those, the market bounces. But we did, you know, break support. We did get a bounce here. And I think, you know, I think we're moving into some sort of a, a correction phase after this big advance. But thinking gets me in trouble all the time. It's better just to rely on the indicators. So as long as that, as I showed those indicators before for the S&P 500, they establish my overall market bias. Now, if you look at the indicators here, I've got 14 period RSI and five period RSI. And these are two different indicators, believe it or not. Uh, 14 days is a lot different than five days, especially when it comes to RSI. And in general, I use 14-day RSI as kind of a trend identification indicator. You know, when it's above 50, the cup is half full. When it is below 50, the cup is half empty. And you get battles around the 50 area in RSI. But what I noticed here is RSI did move above 70 three times. And so that shows good momentum on the upside. And it continues to hold 50 on these pullbacks. So, you know, the first short-term issue to watch with 14 period RSI, is it moving below 50? Now, when you look at five period RSI, you can see that the shape of the line is largely the same, but it's more pronounced, the, the wiggles and the moves above 70 and below 30. You can see here that we got below 30 in December, but we didn't with RSI 14. And you can use RSI 5 as a mean reversion indicator, I think. So if you have a bullish bias on the market, when you go below 30, that means you're short-term oversold with five-period RSI. And we got the bounce yesterday. So it's moved back above 30 with the gap up. Now that means, you know, the short-term uptrend has turned again. So we're in the midst of a short-term oversold bounce. Uh, but when I look at the overall market picture, it's more mixed than up. So, you know, might get just choppy trading out of this. Now with QQQ, we had a meeting lines candlestick form on Thursday and Friday. And this candlestick pattern forms, you can see the black candlestick there. It closed on the low, near the low. And then you had a weak open on Friday. You open down here and then you close strong and you close near the prior close. But you have two different colors with the candlesticks. One is black and filled, which means you open near the high and close near the low. And the other is hollow or white. And it means you open near the low and you close near the high. And those the closes basically are meeting and it's a reversal kind of candlestick. And you got the gap up yesterday on Monday and the strong surge. So that reinforces support here in that 170, 172 area. And you can see RSI is holding above 50, 14 period. And then five period RSI moved back above 30. So it's not oversold anymore. And then we look at IWM. And I've just got 14 period RSI on IWM. But... What you can see is RSI moved below 50. It had the deepest dip of the three. So that means it was the weakest. And you can see IWM broke down here. It's rebounded, but 
it's still an it hasn't reversed this downturn or this breakdown here just yet. So it's the weakest of the three. So when we look at the 11 sector SBDRs and SPY, you can see that technology led with communication services not far behind. They were the big gainers yesterday. And there's SPY marking your benchmark. So these four outperform, which is kind of a weird foursome, technology, communication services, energy, and REITs. And then these were up less, so they underperformed. Financials underperformed and continue to underperform. And that's a, well, it's, it's weighing on the market. And then you look, utilities were up the least. However, utilities is one of the leading sectors because XLU hit a new high. So keep in mind, you need to look at price action to determine which are the real leading sectors. So I, I've got this chart list here and it's got all 11 sectors in SPY. And I can move from summary format to candle glance. And so I can easily look at these sectors for some quick analysis here. And you can see that we've got some, you know, consolidation patterns kind of brewing. You see XLC with kind of a triangle. XLK fell back a little bit, but then surged 2% there. You can see XLI fell back, open weak, but closed strong. Uh, healthcare fell back, but got a bounce. And then if we scroll down, we'll get to the two leaders. And as far as leaders are concerned, I like to look at the chart leaders, as I call it. So there you can see XLU is hitting a new high. That's clearly the strongest chart of these 11 sector SPDRs. And the other strongest chart would be REITs there hitting a new high as well. So there's the real leadership in the two that are hitting new highs. Now, I've heard some people argue that defensive sectors leading like utilities and REITs is negative for the market. Well, no, it's not negative for the market. The market is negative when the majority of sectors turn down and start moving lower. Just because utilities are leading doesn't mean the market can't move higher. It means utilities are leading and that's a sector you want to be focused on as far as, you know, the winning stocks with uptrends, but that doesn't mean the whole market's going to turn because utilities are leading. Now, if you look at XLK here, you can see we got an, a level to watch, a clear level to watch now because we got this big bounce. And so now we have a kind of a reaction low. There's the 200 day. And I would suggest if we close below 69 here, then that's going to be the negative to watch out for as far as the market is concerned. But right now, this advance is still going. We got a pullback, a sharp pullback, became short-term oversold and got a bounce. 20 days above the 200-day, so we're still bullish on technology. Just a note there, uh, this XLK change there in the latter part of June, there are the previous holdings, and here are the current holdings. And you can see it has changed quite a bit because Google and Facebook are no longer part of this ETF. And the three top holdings, Microsoft, Apple, and Visa, had really good days yesterday. And Apple and Visa are trading at new highs for 2019. Also, another thing about these sectors, they're really not indicative of the overall sector. Because if you look at the top two stocks, they account for 33% or 34% of the ETF. I mean, come on, two stocks accounting for the weight of a sector. That doesn't make sense. I think the equal weight sector ETFs provide a better overview of the sector as a whole. You know, you look at materials, you got Dow DuPont, you know, it's over 20% of the ETF. You look at energy, it's ExxonMobil and Chevron, over 30% of the ETF. I'm going to get to me communication services, which is dominated by Google and Facebook. So these sectors are not, the sector SBDRs are not representative of the sectors. They're representative of the large caps in that sector. So here are the top holdings in XLK. And if we look at performance over the past 200 days here, we can see that three are down, Apple, Intel, and IBM, and the rest are up with Salesforce.com and Cisco leading the way. Now, if we back this out and we go to, say, six months, 
we can see that Apple is the only one well, that's down big. Adobe's down a little bit. IBM's down a little bit. And then if we back out to three months, we can see that everything is up. And you can see that three months starts right before the December client decline started. So I like to go back to the early part of December because that's where the market kind of peaked. And you can see that these stocks are above that peak, basically. And Apple's the only one that's not above that peak. Now, there's another way you can analyze these stocks. You can put them in a candle glance chart. And so I just took these symbols and I went up to the symbol entry box at the top and I entered them and I selected candle glance. And so now I've got the top components, the top 10, and there are the top three components there for XLK. And there you can see Microsoft. All right, it's challenging that December high. It's one of the leaders, I think. Apple is still well below that December high there. And you can see Visa is clearly one of the leaders because it is above that December high. So if you look at Apple, there's a clear support level to watch there. And you can probably do that for Microsoft and Visa. And those are the three to watch. When you're looking at these sector SBDRs, you have to watch the top stocks as well because they dominate the ETF. And if we scroll down and we look at some of these other ones, uh, you can see Intel stalling out a little bit, Cisco stalling out a little bit, MasterCard as well, Oracle stalling out. That's a new high for Oracle. Uh, Adobe as well stalling out, as is IBM and Salesforce.com at the bottom. So, you know, we have been correcting actually since the latter middle part of the, there's February there. And you can see we've been moving sideways pretty much since the latter part of February. So here's the communications services sector. And remember that it started trading there in June. So this back data here was before it actually started trading. And there you can see since it started trading and there are the top holdings. There you can see Google and Facebook. Those two account for over 40% of the ETF. And then, you know, you look at the holdings. You know, I just don't see how these companies are that related. I mean, you're going to tell me a video game maker is related to the performance of an old telecom versus, you know, the new Netflix and then a search engine advertising dominated Google. I mean, you know, these holdings just don't make sense as far as being related to me. It's just a hodgepodge of stocks. So if you look at the chart here, you can see you got the big surge here and kind of a triangle consolidation and we're breaking out. But with this bounce, we have a clear support level to watch. And if we break that, then that is going to be negative for XLC, which accounts for around 10% of the S&P 500. So I did the same thing for XLC as I just did for XLK. Here are the top 10 components. And as you can see, they're not related here as far as businesses are concerned or performance. You know, this is 200 days and you can see that one, two, three, four are down. Two are down double digits. So those are the video game makers. And if I move this out to six months, you can see still a bit mixed. Activision down 46%, go to three months, and almost everything is up except Activision and Verizon. And then if we look at year to date, we can see Activision is still down, and the laggards are Disney, AT&T, and Verizon. Now again, we can put these in a candle glance chart to get a little more granularity on what's going on here. So here are the top components and there you can see the top two that account for 40%, Facebook and Google. And Google had a nice pennant breakout that was duly noted. So it's leading and it's at a new high for the year here. Facebook had a little pullback there and broke out. It uh, gapped up yesterday, but closed near the low, but it's still okay. And Netflix, yeah, kind of tough, but there's a support level to watch. So it's still holding up pretty well. 
So home builders got a nice bounce yesterday up one and a half percent and you can see that they bounced the last three days basically on Thursday flat on Friday and then up yesterday. So you know we still have got a constructive pattern here short term which is that advance that we've got going since December. But you can see longer term we're still right near that falling 200 day moving average. And you got a clear support level now to watch at 34. So we'll give the bulls the benefit of the doubt as long as ITB holds above 34. And if you look at the top holdings, again, you can see concentration in just a few names. So they talk about ETFs as spreading the risk. Well, you know, they're pretty concentrated, most of them. The SPDRs, uh, not the sector SPDRs, but the industry group SPDRs like Retail, XRT, and Biotech, XBI, those are ones that have serious diversification because they are spread among dozens of names with relatively equal weightings, whereas these iShares have weightings towards the larger stocks. Lenar and DR Horton over 13%, NVR at 9%, and Pulte there at 7%. So you take it all together and that's like 40% of the ETF in four stocks. So if you're trading this ETF or investing, you need to have an eye, a close eye on those four stocks. So let's take a look. So first up is Lennar, which accounts for 13.6% of the ETF. And we've still got constructive price action, a breakout here, and we continue to make higher highs. We had quite a pullback here. But we got to bounce the last three days, and that gives us a clear support level there. If we close below 45, that would be strike one for ITB, the Home Builder ETF. But right now, it's still doing okay. If we look at DR Horton, the cup is still half full for this stock, and it accounts for 13.4% of the ETF. So you can see the higher high there with the breakout. And then kind of a wild consolidation, if you will, and a breakout. And that breakout zone is largely holding. And we got a nice surge the last three days. So I would suggest if you close below 38, then that has reversed. And that would be strike two on the home builders. And then NVR has a steady uptrend working here. There you can see kind of a consolidation within that uptrend and a breakout. And we can probably use 2550 as support to watch. So again, if you get support breaks in three of the four, the fourth one coming up is Pulte, then you have something to worry about. But as long as the majority holds support, they're doing okay. Pulte was on the arch charge chart list, but I got shaken out because of relative weakness in February. S&P was moving higher and Pulte was not. But on the price chart, you can still see, you know, you had some breakouts and throwbacks. And it looks like another triangle breakout in the works for Pulte. So as long as it holds 26, that breakout is valid. And so those are the four stocks you need to watch when it comes to ITB. So I'm still watching the finance sector fairly closely because some stocks are holding up well, like Bank of America, but others are not. And these charts here show SPY with the gray line there. And when we see SPY overlaid on the chart, we can compare performance with the actual stock. So you can see Bank of America peaked here in early August. And SPY peaked here in September, maybe October there. You can see it started moving lower while SPY was moving higher. And that was a tell of relative weakness. And then you got the breakdown in October. So we got the big rebound and banks were part of that rebound with that big surge we saw from late December to January. And then Bank of America has been flat as it battles its 200-day moving average. So we got a little breakout, but then the pullback, I would say the cup is still half full, but you got to watch it. If we close below 28 and Bank of America, that is going to be a negative. And I've got bandwidth in the lower window 
with a horizontal line at 5%. You can see bandwidth is below 5%, which is its lowest level since September. And bandwidth doesn't give you any clues on the direction of the next break. Uh, you have to watch the price for that. So I would stay with a bullish bias, but if you go below 28, you got to switch to bearish. So here's Citigroup. And you can see Citigroup is not as strong as Bank of America. So Citigroup was moving step for step with the market up until September. And you can see that it surged with the market in January. And the market continued higher in February, but Citigroup kind of stalled out. So it's not keeping pace. It's looking weaker than Bank of America. So, you know, if you had to pick between the two, Bank of America would be the winner. And you can see it's below its falling 200-day moving average. Keep in mind that finance is still the third biggest sector in the S&P 500. So here's Goldman Sachs, and Goldman is really lagging. If you look at the chart here, you can see Goldman peaked just ahead of the S&P 500. And you can see the S&P 500 was moving higher here, and Goldman was just flat. So it's still in consolidation mode. And, you know, perhaps this is a triangle taking shape, but Goldman needs to get a breakout. And if I had to watch one stock, I would watch this one for clues on where the market might be going. So you get that breakout above 200-ish. That's going to be quite positive for brokers and the finance sector. But if you get a break below support here, that is going to be negative. And if Goldman can't go up, then there's an issue with the market. So moving on to our next group, we got JP Morgan and JP Morgan's kind of mixed, if you will. You can see it's still below the falling 200 day moving average. So even though banks led on this big advance here and you got the breakout there again, it's still below the falling 200 day moving average. And then you look at what SPY did, moved higher and JP Morgan's largely flat. So maybe this is a little wedge thingy and watching for a breakout here. Uh, you move below 102 and that's going to be a big negative for JP Morgan. So you have a clear support level there for Bank of America, JP Morgan and Goldman to watch going forward. Then we look at some of the regional banks. This is fifth third. And yeah, maybe this is an inverse head and shoulders pattern here. I prefer the surge and a potential flag, but regardless of which one it is, there's a clear resistance level there. We need to break out just above 28. And you can also see that, look at this, you know, fifth third was moving down for months while SBY was moving higher. So there was a clear tell there. And U.S. Bank Corp, similar situation, just a consolidation, watching 50 on the downside, stay bullish. And if you close below 50, then you got to get bearish. So last Thursday, I highlighted bonds. And today I'll recap here. I'm bullish on IEF, the 7 to 10 year Treasury bond ETF. And by extension, I would be bullish on TLT because they're going to move in the same direction. And if you look at the chart here, you can clearly see that we had the breakouts there, the break above the 200 day, the break above the prior highs, and then we moved into a triangle consolidation. And after this surge we had last week, it looks like we're on the brink of a breakout. And that means yields could be heading lower. My target was like 2%. All right, so this concludes this edition of On Trend. Thanks very much for tuning in, and remember to stay on the right side of the trend.